In 1992, Suzanne Kappa was a vulnerable 16-year-old girl who was described by people who knew her as just wanting someone to love and care about her. These six people befriended Suzanne, but took advantage of her, using her need to be accepted against her. For the most minor of reasons, these six kidnapped Suzanne, held her captive for a week, tortured her, and eventually murdered her by setting her on fire while she was still alive. Welcome to Evil Among Us. Suzanne Jane Capper was born on September 1st, 1976 in Manchester, England, UK, to Elizabeth Capper. She never knew her biological father, but was raised by her stepfather, John Capper. Suzanne was a vulnerable child who suffered from learning difficulties, which led to her being rather naive and trusting, but, by all accounts, she was a happy and caring girl. However, Suzanne had a difficult and lonely upbringing. In 1990, John and Elizabeth separated, Elizabeth then abandoned Suzanne and she ended up in care. She would sometimes be able to stay at her mother's house or that of her stepfather's or sew for stuff with friends, but appeared to have no stability and few people she could rely on. This lack of stability appeared to affect Suzanne and she began playing truant from school and hanging around with the wrong people, likely as a way to form a connection with someone. One of the people that she befriended was Jean Powell, who used to babysit Suzanne when she was a child. In 1992, when the murder occurred, Powell was 26 years old and lived in a dilapidated property at 97 Langworthy Road in Manchester with her three children. Also living at the address was Powell's best friend, a 24-year-old mother, also her three children, called Bernadette McNeely. It was an address well known to the police where drugs were prepared and sold, with there being an industrial set of kitchen scales in the property for weighing out the drugs. Stolen car parts were stored and sold at the address, and there were car seats placed in the house for people to sit on. There was antisocial behaviour consistently, with the neighbours washing being set on fire on at least one occasion. It was a place no one should live, especially not children. However, Suzanne would regularly stay there, believing that these women were her friends, despite them bullying and mocking her. Due to Suzanne's vulnerabilities, it seems she didn't realise how little they actually cared about her and the danger she was in. To illustrate how she was treated, Powell would get Suzanne to go to work with her as a cleaner, but would take all of her wages. When Elizabeth, Suzanne's mother, confronted Powell about this, Powell threatened to burn Elizabeth's house down. Frequent visitors to the property included Powell's former husband, 29-year-old Glynn, with them continuing to engage in a sexual relationship despite being separated. McNeely's boyfriend, 16-year-old Anthony Dudson, who was also having sexual intercourse with Powell. Powell was also sexually involved with 27-year-old Jeffrey Lee, a regular visitor to the address as a purchase of amphetamines. Another frequent visitor to the house was Powell's younger brother, Clifford Pook, also known as Hayes, who was aged 18 years old. These were the six who committed an unspeakable act of evil against a vulnerable 16-year-old girl. It's clear that they were antisocial, living on the fringes of society, engaging in promiscuous sexual activity, drug use and criminal activity, all whilst exposing children to this environment. Suzanne's elder sister, Michelle, later recalled how all six individuals would bully and mock Suzanne and take advantage of her good nature. However, Suzanne kept returning because she saw any attention, even constant bullying, as being better than being alone. All six individuals would assault Suzanne and make false accusations against her, including that she had stolen their belongings, likely just to have an excuse to further beat her. In a heartbreaking admission, Michelle states that in autumn 1992, mere weeks before her death, Suzanne turned up on her mother's doorstep begging for somewhere to stay as she had been beaten up badly by the group. However, her mother turned her away because her new boyfriend did not approve of Suzanne living there. Having nowhere else to go, Suzanne had to return to Powell's home. What led to the events of 7th of December 1992 is not entirely clear, but it appears that several of the group got infected with pubic lice, and despite the group sleeping amongst themselves and other people in squally conditions, all of them collectively blamed Suzanne for their ailment. In addition, it's mentioned that Suzanne was apparently being held responsible for a coat going missing, so the group decided to take revenge on Suzanne and teach her a lesson. Suzanne was, on this date, at her stepfather's house, when McNeely and Powell went and told her that a boy she fancied was waiting to meet her at 97 Langworthy Road. Suzanne went willingly with them and stepped straight into a nightmare. As soon as Suzanne entered the property, she was attacked, with Glynn holding her down and shaving her head and eyebrows. 
Then a plastic bag was put over her head and she was beaten. Suzanne was then kicked by Powell and McNeely as she lay curled on the floor and both women took turns beating her with a wooden pole and a belt. She was then taken into the bathroom and forced to shave off her pubic hair before being locked in a cupboard overnight. The following morning, Suzanne was taken upstairs and locked in another cupboard. On 8th of December, she was transferred to a house a few doors down, McNeely's previous home, because concerned that Powell and McNeely's six children were disturbed by Suzanne's crying. Oh yes, just to point out that everything that happened so far occurred whilst the children were around to witness the abuse of this poor girl. In this property, Suzanne was tied spread eagle and upturned on a bed with electrical flex in a downstairs back room. These are pictures from the crime scene taken by the police. Over the next five days, Suzanne was subject to a series of acts of torture, including being beaten, injected with drugs, burnt with cigarettes and being forced to listen to rave music on maximum volume through headphones placed on her ears. It is stated that before each torture session, at least one member of the group would state, quote, Chucky's coming to play, a reference to the character Chucky from the Child's Play horror films. At some point during this week, Pook and Lee called at the house and saw Suzanne blindfolded and gagged, tied to the bed, but they did nothing to help her. In fact, they joined in the torture. Suzanne by this point was covered in her own excrement and was forced to have a bath which contained disinfectant and a stiff brush was used on her with such force that it removed parts of her skin. Clifford Pook then used pliers to rip out two of Suzanne's teeth. Dudson later described this act stating, quote, I was stood at the doorway with Jeannie Powell and Bernie McNeely. Cliff Pook took her gag off. He told her to open her mouth. He said, right, I'm going to rip your teeth out. He started hitting her teeth with the pliers. He got the pliers on and started pulling it out, but it just snapped and chipped. Then he hit them a few more times. He then put the pliers on again and really, really pulled. He pulled Suzanne's head forward until there was a snap and he had the tooth in the pliers. He did the same again and was laughing. At the end of five days of torture, Suzanne's arms and legs were broken. She was bruised and battered, and parts of her skin were either red or had been removed by scrubbing with a stiff brush. On 14th of December 1992, the group had become aware that Suzanne's family were going to report her missing, so they decided they needed to dispose of her. In the early hours of this day, Suzanne was forced into the boot of a stolen car and driven to an isolated area of Stockport, approximately 10 miles from Manchester. In the car were McNeely, Powell, Glynn and Dudson, with McNeely being described as, quote, giggling along the way. When they arrived, Suzanne was forced out of the boot and pushed down an embankment. While she was lying there, she was doused in petrol and several members of the group tried to set light to her. Eventually, they succeeded, and while Suzanne was ablaze, McNeely apparently shouted, quote, burn, baby, burn. They left Suzanne for dead and drove away. However, Suzanne was not dead, and despite suffering burns to 75-80% to 80% of her body, she bravely dragged herself out of the embankment and managed to stagger approximately 400 metres down the road. Eventually, she was found by men on their way to work and was rushed to the local house of Michael and Margaret Coop, who tried their best to comfort Suzanne whilst they waited for an ambulance. Michael Coop later stated, quote, Both her hands appeared like ash, her legs were just raw meat, and her feet appeared to be badly charred. I was struck by how polite the victim was. She was constantly thanking my wife for her assistance. Margaret Coop recalled this incident later, stating, quote, I instinctively went to put my arms around her, and she pulled away because she could not bear to be touched. Her head was shaved, and there were recent, not new cuts to her head. Her face was almost featureless. Her hands were red raw and black at the fingertips. Her legs were red from the top to bottom. She couldn't bear anything near her legs. This part of the case has really stuck with me, and I believe that it shows the sort of person that Suzanne was. Despite probably being in horrific amounts of pain, she was polite and gracious to the people who were trying to help her. I think this shows two things. Firstly, the sort of gentle soul she was, but also, heartbreakingly, her desire to be liked by everyone. So, regardless of the situation, she would try to be as good a person as she could be, hence why she was focused so much on thanking others rather than thinking about herself. Suzanne was rushed to the Burns Unit of Withington Hospital in Manchester and was able to give police a detailed description of what had happened to her and named all six individuals responsible. However, despite her courage and the best efforts of the doctors, Suzanne's injuries were too severe and on December the 18th, 1992, just three months after her 16th birthday, Suzanne Jane Kappa died. 
Police acted quickly and arrested all six individuals named by Suzanne while she was still alive, charging them with various offences. When she died, these were upgraded to murder. All six denied their offences and the trial began on 16th of November 1993 at Manchester Crown Court, with each blaming the other and attempting to minimise their behaviour. However, the court was unconvinced and all of them were convicted of offences linked to the torture and murder of Suzanne Kappa. Bernadette McNeely was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life with a minimum tariff of 25 years. Jean Powell, found guilty of murder, sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 25 years. Glyn Powell, found guilty of murder, sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 25 years. Geoffrey Lee, acquitted of murder but given a 12-year sentence for false imprisonment. Anthony Dudson, found guilty of murder, sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 18 years. Clifford Pook, acquitted of murder, but given a 15-year sentence for conspiracy to cause grievous bodily harm. It appears that McNeely, Lee and Pook have all since been released. The status of the other three is unknown. Thank you for watching. I'm going to forgo making any real comments as I believe it may detract from the seriousness of this case. However, I will say that Suzanne's murder happened just two months before the killing of two-year-old Jamie Bolger by two ten-year-old boys, Robert Thompson and John Venables, and understandably, this became the focus of national attention. As a result, the case of Suzanne is not well known and got little press attention. I think that's a real shame, as I believe that Suzanne's memory should be preserved, and people should know and learn from the case of a 16-year-old girl who was vulnerable, but also polite, kind and brave, and just wanted to be loved, and how her young life was so cruelly snatched away from her. I sincerely hope, from the bottom of my heart, that she is now at peace.